Uh, All right. I can turn it up if you need to. Hello, hello, hello? Hello? There we go. All, All right. Um, hi, I'm Max. I'm from Voron Design. I'm the founder of Voron Design. Uh, before I begin talking about Voron, I want to give a shout out to the show organizers. They've done a bang up job putting the show together. Round of applause, please. Thank you. Uh, this was a phenomenally pleasant experience and uh, we, uh, we will 100% be back next year. Awesome. Yep. Um, so what is Voron? Um, most of you, I think, know what Voron is. Some of you don't. Uh, we are an open source group, um, more of a project really than a company. Uh, in fact, we're aggressively not a company. Um, we've had a lot of questions about people going, well, how much is this and how can I buy this? And I say, go talk to LDO because they do the kits for us and, or literally anybody else, or you can source it yourself. Um, so how do you do this? Um, well, we, uh, if you think of it in, the, in terms of a company, we do product development just like any other company does. Uh, from idea to doing mechanical engineering and development on it to um, having that printer go into our release pipeline, which means it, it has a manual, it gets uh, bill of materials um, and all that jazz. And we stop right short at actually getting the product and selling it. Um, we let other people do that for us and uh, it's worked out pretty well for us. It kind of removes the running of a business out of the process of out of uh, really the fun of developing 3D printers, which what we love, which is what we love. Um, but it's uh, it's been incredibly successful. Um, I'm incredibly humbled every day by what I see on the Discord. The community has grown around the project. Um, seeing all of your faces here and seeing all of the Vorons built on the show floor this year. Um, originally in 2016, um, there was a company, MZBot that I started as part of the Voron, and the Voron project was kind of underneath it. Um, and um, that company no longer exists, but Voron Design, it, it goes on as an open source project, which is the beauty of open source, really. Um, you kind of want companies to open source their stuff, so when the company is not around anymore, you still have the community and the parts to be able to fix and do what you need to do. So in 2017, um, I got a DM on Reddit of a guy that wanted to scale up uh, Voron V1, which used eight millimeter rods, to 24 inches by 24 inches. And I said, um, I have a better idea. So uh, the sketches for V2, Voron V2, gantry and kind of belt path was already, it was on a piece of cardboard somewhere in my shop. And uh, so I, I, I will build you a printer. It'll be all metal and uh, it will do what you need it to do. So it was kind of like the last large machine, the last machine that I did as part of MZBot before the company folded over. Um, uh, so machine got built, it got deployed to Minneapolis. Um, it served out its useful lifespan and then got put into a warehouse. And then about a year ago, um, the person that used to maintain that machine that no longer works at that company said, hey, I got the machine back in my house. Uh, what can I do to fix it? And I basically said, I will, uh, I will build a V2.4 Voron for you and trade you for that machine and then pay for shipping. So eventually the machine made it all the way back to California where it sat in my shop for a year where I, I thought I, I stared at it. It was a pretty rough shape. Some of it due to some mechanical problems it always really had because it was a really early prototype. Um, and part of it is just, you know, normal wear and tear. And um, at some point, Steve from Steve Builds, that guy, said, hey, I got a van and I'm driving to Colorado. You want to bring a V24? And I said, let me rebuild it first. And which, which launched into what you see on the show floor today, uh, which is uh, V24 R2. Uh, it is basically a completely redone machine. The only thing I kept were the side panels because they were too big for set consent. So I had to do those with a router in my shop and the frame. Uh, everything else is all brand new. So that's the story on the giant machine you see out there. Um, I think that's about it. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, so we're slating, uh, by the way, that machine will be released. 
and it won't be named V24 because that's super confusing. We've kind of learned our lesson. Like, is a V1.8 a V2.7 B plus? Yeah, so it's, it, what you see over there is basically a prototype for what we're working on for release in December, January timeframe. And it's gonna be called the V24 Mini, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be called anything with numbers in it. And uh, we're, we're, we're targeting a $3,000 bomb for it. Um, considering that currently, if you were to commission an ABS print of size that machine can produce, um, it'll cost you around five grand in US. So build that and it pays for it. No, most of the parts are milled. So yeah. Uh, we can maintain pretty high chamber temperatures just with the, the, the bed setup. Um, the bed on it is basically four uh, 300 millimeter spec boron beds. Um, I know this because I melted the XN stop yesterday. So now it has sensorless homing. But um, it will print ABS no problem. It could probably do more exotic filaments, but we haven't tested yet. Again, prototype, just got it running. I believe it, it can do whatever you want it to do. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. You, in the back. Oh, okay, you just have a camera on. Okay, the question is, uh, we, we bring the bed up to temperature sequentially uh, because combined heater value is 26 kilowatt, uh, 2.6 kilowatts, which would blow any breaker that we have in US basically. Um, they're def um, I don't actually have a heated bed defined in V24. There are generic heaters. They're named like by bed one, bed two, bed three, bed four. And then I have a macro in clipper that brings them up sequentially. Yeah. So you boo, you basically set set bed temperature, target, whatever, and then it does its thing. You can, uh, you can PID a heater. Yeah, you can PID a generic heater. Uh, for PID testing, I basically just PID tested one bed and then copied the config over to that three. Yeah. Yes. Um, on larger printers, gravity becomes a issue. An issue. Um, in earlier days, back in 2017 when I did it, um, it was a bigger issue because we didn't have the electronics or the software to compensate for any of this. Um, it is less of an issue now because you can just, if you use, especially if you use tap, which is which is what it does, what it has with nozzle probing, um, you can kind of let software figure out where you perfect bed is and um, everything kind of takes care of itself. Um, the machine is the size that it is because of the old spec from 2017, but it can, I think, safely scale up to all the way up to a meter for build, build volume. The issue becomes where you're gonna put it. So it's already a large machine and it clocks in just over 200 pounds. Um, if you're going to scale it up, it's going to be heavier, obviously, and cost more money and yeah, so, yeah, so, yes, you can probably scale it. Um, I don't know what will happen. The gantry will survive it, but the rest of the printer and logistics of running a machine that of that size, um, will probably not be a, a garage endeavor, more of like a, a warehouse. So, yes. Hi, Sanity. Hi. Uh, where does the idea of using the flying gantry come The flying gantry actually originated in um, for V24, and it got ported to V2 
all the way to 2.4 that we have right now. Um, the idea came from the fact that lifting a bed of that size is not practical, especially if you have a 10 kilogram print on top of it. Um, so I was looking at, there was a large scale printer, I uh, forgot what it's called, um, but they use the flying gantry. One something, um, they use the flying gantry and their bed was actually not fixed to the printer. It was on casters and they would wheel it in. It was like a one meter by one meter printer uh, back in 2016. And they would, wheel, they would wheel the bed into the printer and then it would print on top of it with a flying gantry set up and they would wheel the print out. Uh, it was one of the biggest printers at the time. Uh, I don't know if the company still exists, but that's where idea came from. It made sense in my head because, yeah. And then the open style gantry, not the full box, um, was kind of like an idea of the, uh, the, your print being accessible. So if you don't have a crossbeam in your face when the print is done, it's preferable. And th through my testing, I realized you don't actually need the crossbeam if all four corners are supported. Um, that's actually, um, I want to touch on that. There, uh, when 2. Point, uh, Voron 2, 2.1, 2 2.0 um, started, became a, uh, a thing and we released it, a lot of people are like, oh, it has four corners and you only need three to make a flat plane, which is true when your plane is rigid. Uh, if you look at a V2.4 uh, V2 gantry, it's not rigid. So you need all four points. It's basically like if you take a picture frame and look at how it bends, uh, you kind of need it to support, you, you need to support it in all four corners to conform it to a flat plane, which is a bed. So that was a fun discussion. There were many paragraphs written about it on the internet because the internet exists. Any more questions? Yes. We didn't ask them to, they just kind of showed up. Um, we still to this day don't have a full go buy this kit endorsement as a blanket statement. We try to be very agnostic about suppliers. Um, we personally recommend it if we have a personal relationship with them, for example, like one of us in the group has a personal relationship with Fabrico, LDO, we'll say, oh, those guys are cool. You, you can buy from them. Um, but as a group, as a whole, we don't have a list of like, oh, these are preferred vendors, quote unquote, because we try to be agnostic and um, to the suppliers, uh, which gives everybody kind of a level playing field effectively when, when uh, providing parts for the users. And it benefits the community because it just makes things easier for the project if we can rely on multiple suppliers um, to supply their kits and let them kind of fight it out as far as this is the best kit, this is the worst kit. Um, the community kind of bores out the bad apples fairly quickly. Um, and um, the, the providers and the, um, the resellers and um, the manufacturers that are quality kind of get lifted up. Hi, what's your name? Hello. Um, is the printer easy enough to build at home? Oh, um, I would suggest a V0, which is a much smaller machine. Uh, we have had uh, a few kids actually build a printer at Murph last year. Um, there was a, a, a son and a dad team where they, uh, they put together a printer, um, a V0, which is the smaller one, the smallest one we have right now. Um, they got it built. Um, we had a couple of Voron guys help them out because he was on the show floor. But if you don't have Voron developers literally on the show floor with you, um, there is a Discord community and they're super, super, super helpful. Um, we, um, we have a lot of pride in our community. Um, we've worked really hard to kind of clean it up and make it sure it remains not toxic, as not toxic as possible. Um, and we try really hard to self-police. And when the self-policing doesn't work, we have an entire admin team to kind of come in and make sure that uh, 
everybody acts like an adult, basically. So, um, but yes, you can totally build that printer. In fact, V0 was originally started as a project to make a printer that I could build with my daughter, who is seven. I've been waiting for her to grow up enough to build one with her. So that's totally gonna happen. Thank you. Yes. What's my favorite printer? I think 2.4 because I've had the most involvement in creating it. But the workhorse I would say is a Trident. Because it's just it's the it's like the tank of Voron printers. And Steve is largely responsible for that one. What's your thoughts on the salad fork? The salad fork. So we have an entire sub community of Voron printers called Printers for Ants, which is basically they they take uh, Voron Zero parts and make other printers out of them. And uh, some of them are amazing and some of them are completely insane and practical, but still fun. Uh, Salad Fork is awesome. Are you the developer by any chance? Uh, I am a software engineer, but I, my skills are far below where they should be. All right. I'm working on it. Yeah, I'm a, I mean, my day job is a software engineer. I do mechanical, mechanical engineering as a hobby. Um, I've been doing it for many, many years, um, and uh, I like it very much. Any more questions? Oh, easy. Uh, so we use multiple CAD programs in Voron Design. Um, I personally use Fusion 360 because that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, it's still free for the most part, becoming less free by day. Um, there are multiple designers uh, that I know that, you, that are using SolidWorks because they have a license either through their work or through their school. Um, I don't know of any other ones. Um, the multiple CAD platforms become challenging when you're trying to share designs. Uh, thankfully, for the most part, I think STEP is still very nice common denominator so we can uh, throw step files around back and forth during the design process um, but yeah fusion um, I don't have a I don't have a glowing endorsement for fusion because uh, you get what you pay for but um, so far it's been okay yes Okay, the biggest challenge, personally, <laughs> no, um, I think the biggest challenge was um, the most recent one, I, I, I'll go with the most, there have been many challenges, the most recent one I think was hitting a deadline of getting V24 completely buttoned up and getting it here, um, that was an exciting process. It's kind of a slog at the at the very end. Uh, the the flex build plate that uh, Fabrico did for us didn't show up until a week before we left, so that was exciting. Um, what I'm most excited about, I think, is the the growth that we've seen in the community recently, and it just continues to grow, um, and all of that. As we intake more and more numbers and more and more members in our, into our community, we haven't seen too many issues, which is kind of exciting. Um, again, for the most part, I think people that gravitate towards Voron are, for the most part, self-policing and grown-ups. So that helps. We have, uh, we have a few projects in the works. Again, V24, whatever the name is going to end up being is going to be released and then in uh, 2024 we're going to start pushing for uh, getting our CNC projects out the door uh, because I mean um, the CNC that I have it did all the work of milling parts for V24 um, so I would say it's ready it just needs to get buttoned up um, it needs a 300 page manual of which 100 pages of it will be 
how to get everything square because uh, you can't make square and precise parts without the machine being also square and precise. Uh, doing that with gardening tools is hard, but it's possible. Anyway, working on it. So 20, yeah, that's, that's our goal. That does make sense, except for it's we're, yeah, yeah we're, it's not gonna be 24, exactly. But we're, we're keeping the spec, but not just not the name. Yes. Uh, I, was, so, I guess, what the out of all the Good question, and I, I did see you, I'll, I'll get to you next. Um, Clipper. So V24 originally in 2017 was built with Marlin. The quad gantry leveling where it probes four points and, and adjusts the gantry, I did that in Marlin originally. Um, it took me three months. Uh, the same code was ported to Clipper in two weeks. The th other thing about Clipper is it made v, uh, V2 line of printers, V2.1, 2. and now 2.4, uh, possible for general consumer because you didn't have to have a Marlin controller with eight stepper drivers on it. You can literally take any Raspberry Pi and plug in unlimited amount of like RAM sports that you have in your basement and have unlimited amount of fans, heaters, steppers, etc. Um, there, it basically solves the problem of having to have specific hardware controllers um, and being able to go fast um, is kind of the the byproduct, a happy byproduct, if you will. Um, as far as like figuring out how do you get electronics into a specific thing that you want to do, uh, just makes it so much easier. Uh, Clipper makes thing crazy things like the eight x eight printer over there that has eight uh, motors for X and Y. You can do it because you can plug in as many controllers as you want. And it's easy to configure because it's literally just a configuration file. You restart the host and all your configurations are there. You don't have to recompile. The downside is there's a little bit of boot time, but if you don't turn your machine off, you don't have to deal with it. <laughs> what was the question in the back? Are you aware of any programs or organizations that are able to help a nonprofit with the finances of getting some of these machines into their lab? I don't know of any right now um, but if you look at the suppliers that we have such as Fabrico, LDO, I don't know, West3D for example um, and if you reach out to them and set up a relationship with them personally I'm sure they will be able to help you with that or they will point you somebody who can. Of course. I think we got five more minutes. One last question. Um, for just a general boron design process, it's a bit of a chaotic, chaotic experience. Um, I think a lot of people think that we have a very polished pipeline for our printer design. Um, and, Uber is laughing in the back over there. Uh, that's not the case at all. It starts with, hey, that would be cool. And then we, somebody prototypes it um, and they go, yeah, that's not gonna work. And then we try something else. And uh, eventually we, we settle on something that kind of does work. And that got turned into, basically somebody gets a wild hair up their butt and they go on a, on a development spree. And then eventually, a printer emerges. For example, Switchwire, exactly. Um, Switchwire was an interesting process. We started with uh, capstan and uh, wires, which is where the Switchwire came from. We reached out to the guy that did, that did a, um, a rep rep based on capstan in uh, uh, Core XZ specifically um, in 2015 and basically messaged them on YouTube and said, hey, where did you get the capstan pulleys and all that stuff? And he basically told us, no, no, just use belts. I'm like, okay, belts it is. Then we go through kind of a QC process. Um, once the machine is buildable, um, we'll have people jump in and basically build the machines and run them. Um, 
figure out what things don't work in assembly process, what things don't work in printing process. Um, I believe the Stealth Burner front end went through a hundred revisions of tweaking by millimeters of stuff, um, features on the tool head to make sure that it does print well. Um, our whole goal is to print parts without supports uh, because we also have a program called PIF, uh, Printed Forward. And um, that's also our crucible for QA. So when we have revisions to large machines like Trident or uh, 2.4, um, those revisions basically go through and they get deployed into the PIF farms that we have running, that, are, that people are running for us basically. Um, and those, all of those changes basically get thousands of, thousands of hours of QA on it. And when stuff breaks, they'll report back to us and say, okay, that doesn't work. And we, we go back to the, uh, the drawing board and fix it. Once we're fairly comfortable with how things are going and enough of us have enough spare cycles to kind of push it out the door, uh, that's where the release pipeline starts, where we start doing the manual for it. Um, we finalize the bomb, which is the bill of materials for it. Um, I go in and figure out the configurator on the web page, and um, then we'll do an and then we figure out, okay, when can we get everybody on a stream so we can do an announcement for it. Um, then we do announcement, and um, then it's released. If we were a normal company, this this would then go into how do we get suppliers on board, figure out our chain uh, supplier supply chain, and release a product, and how do we do marketing for it? Um, but yeah, we don't care about any of that because we're not a company. So the, basically, our fun ends with releasing it to the public, and then we're going to go back to working on some other cool stuff. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. I did not expect this many people. Um, hopefully I answered all your questions, and um, I hope you had a good time at uh, Rocky Mountain Rep Rep Festival. <laughs>